This is Play by Playcast. Is that faster than a greyhound? The podcast about play by play guys. For play by play guys, by I'm told, a play by play guy. It's a bold strategy, Cotton. Let's see if it pays off for him. Now, here's the host of Play by Playcast, Todd Bodet. <laughs> Wait, the Motel 6 guy? We'll leave the light on for you. No, Joel Godet. Joe Godet. Joel. Joe. Joel? Joel, with an L. Okay. Here's your host, Joel Godet. Don't worry, nobody's listening anyway. All right, it is the second day of Christmas. Welcome into Play by Playcast, everybody. It's the second day of the NCAA men's basketball tournament. First round where there are games non-stop. So if you're listening to this on time, you're either listening to it Friday morning, so enjoy the games today, or you're listening to it during the games, so, so why? Um, or you're listening to it uh, the day after when there are still games on because it's the first and second round this weekend. What an awesome time to be a sports fan and particularly uh, particularly to be a fan of uh, broadcasting sports because you get to kick back and listen to some awesome voices. Jim Nance and uh, Ian Eagle was on today. Ian Eagle was talking about cup spillage when he almost got drilled. Stats guy saved the broadcast booth from a, an errant basketball today. And then Ian yelled out... Uh, a guy is not human after he buried a three. Like, what awesome broadcasting to be able to sit back and listen to uh, during the first and second rounds of the NCAA tournament. So hopefully you guys have all enjoyed that. Anyway, this is Play by Playcast. It is the podcast about play by play broadcasters for play by play broadcasters hosted by a play by play broadcaster. It's a professional development pod dedicated to telling the tips, tricks, experience, stories, process, and preparation of some of the biggest and best play-by-play announcers in the business. You can find us on social media at PXPCast. You can find me at Joel Godet, J-O-E-L-G-O-D-E-T-T. And a reminder to give us a rating and or review if you have an opportunity as well on iTunes or whatever medium you are listening to this podcast. Uh, our guest today is uh, Robert Lee, who I uh, had a chance to sit down with last week. I was in Cleveland doing the Mid-American Conference Women's Basketball Championship on CBS, and he was in Cleveland doing the Mid-American Conference Men's Basketball Championship on ESPN. So we crossed paths, uh, sat there, watched the uh, men's semifinals together for a little bit, uh, realized I couldn't do my prep work sitting at midcourt. So I uh, wound up going back to my hotel room to finish my notes off, but we had a, a good chat on Friday night. And then uh, sat down after my game Saturday, before his game on Saturday, and uh, knocked out this episode of the podcast. You may know Robert Lee. If you Google him, it is all you will find, literally, for like the first 20 pages on Google. Robert Lee, of course, was the ESPN broadcaster who was supposed to broadcast the football game in Charlottesville after the incidents that happened in Charlottesville. Um... A year ago or two, God, I don't remember how, like, time is just like a weird wormhole at this point. A year ago or or two years ago, um, and then wound up not doing that game, and it turned into an entire internet controversy. Uh, Off the top, I just want to say, we do not discuss that here on the podcast. So if you're curious to hear that perspective of things, uh, we don't dive into it. Uh, It is what it is. Um, He's never really talked about it publicly. And uh, we'll leave it at that. Um, Wanted to get into the actual play-by-play perspective and his story of coming up in this business and uh, how he approaches games and all of that. So if you are hoping over the next half hour to to hear all of that, uh, we do not get into that. Um, But that is just something to, to lay out at the very beginning here. Because Robert is so much more than just what you will find if you Google the first 20 pages of his name for eternity. Uh, He he began broadcasting at Syracuse University, uh, wound up in the minor leagues after that, and uh, eventually at Siena, where he broadcast women's basketball and then football, which they don't have anymore, uh, men's basketball, made his way to television, and then made his way from uh, there on to ESPN, where he actually did uh, the MAC men's basketball package on Friday nights this past year. So uh, sat down with Robert to talk about his path through his career how he approaches doing games, uh, all of our favorite questions that we ask every week here on this podcast with Robert Lee from ESPN. Kick back, relax, enjoy, and uh, hopefully your brackets aren't too busted. We start with a school that might have busted some brackets. Syracuse got beat last night, and uh, Robert 
talks about going to Syracuse and uh, what his experience was like to jumpstart his broadcasting career. It's Robert Lee on PXPCast. Some of the guys I graduated with included like uh, Adam Shine, who's done well for himself on uh, you know CBS Sports Network and with NFL stuff. Um, no one else really in my class still broadcasts. Uh, a couple years behind me was people like Andrew Catalan, Damon Amendolar, Carter Blackburn. Um, but yeah, AER was, uh, from the impression I get, a little bit different back then. Like nobody worked for Z89 and WAER, and no one did that. Uh, but now I think that's actually kind of commonplace from what I understand. Um, you know, how I feel about that. <laughs> Who knows? We, we broke down the barriers about 10 years ago when I was there. It was a very weird, like, you work at Z89? Or like, yeah, like... They have games. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that didn't happen uh, while when I was in school way back in the dark ages. Um, but no, it was, it was a great experience, obviously, you know, a great lineage of uh, people who've come through there. And, uh, you know, some of the things I got to do there, honestly, uh, and games I got to broadcast are probably better than some of the game, most of the games I've done since then. You know, I got to go to the uh, Orange Bowl. People always are amazed when I say that the football team was actually way better than the basketball team when I was in school. Donovan McNabb was the quarterback all four years that I was in school. Uh, so I got to go to the Orange Bowl. We went to Maui for uh, the Maui Invitational, which was awesome. And uh, the lacrosse team was really good back then. So, uh, yeah, it was a great experience. Did you call a national title? Did you get a chance to do that with lacrosse? No. they. Uh, my senior, or what amounted my last year with uh, lacrosse, they made the final four but lost either in the final or the – semifinal to Princeton and did not win. Actually, all, f all four years I was there, they did not win the national title. Great. <laughs> Thanks for that, guys. Um, what was Donovan McNabb like? What was it like seeing his college games? He, you can't even describe how exciting he was. And, and, and although he became probably a better player as he got older, he got less exciting. When he was a freshman, he was just this guy running around with his hair on fire, you know, breaking six tackles, throwing the ball after he was over the line by five yards. And, I mean, just it was just incredible. He was so exciting when he burst onto the scene as a freshman. As he got further along in his career, he became a little more, I guess, pro-style, where he became more polished and maybe made more good plays. But uh, some of those just crazy, you know, improvisations were just i mean it was incredible back when he first started well, now you sound like every eagles fan <laughs> yeah yeah and i mean people he had a good career in the nfl i, I know he takes some flack because he never uh, won the super bowl but you know and, and people didn't think he should have been the number two pick the eagles really their fans weren't happy that they took him uh but he went on to have a great career did you ever have a jim Beheim moment i feel like he likes to he likes to not raz students, but he knows when a student is asking a question and, and it has to be a good one. Otherwise, you will not get the answer you're looking for. Uh, did you have a run in? Uh, not necessarily a run in at a press conference, per se. I remember, I think before um, I think before my senior year when I was the sports director, uh, he actually called in all the campus media to his office and uh, had sort of a, you know, playing of the ground rules, uh, which I thought was interesting. You know, take that as however you want. But uh now, that was probably my closest interaction with him, to be honest with you. We didn't interview him before the game. We would interview uh, Mike Hopkins before the game. So we, we didn't really have a lot of contact with Coach Beheim. So you go to Syracuse. You graduate from college. What did you want your path to be? What did you think your path was going to be? Uh, how did you set out as a 22-year-old a broadcaster? Yep. So uh, you know, I had an index card with every minor league baseball team on it uh, with the name of their general manager and, uh, you know, kind of notes about whether or not I had called them and such. Uh, the Internet, when I graduated, was just barely a thing. So I dial up, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Big time. Uh, I got my first email address when I was in college. And, uh, you know, I think nowadays there's, you know, job boards, there's websites, there's all these ways to find things out. But back then, you know, I'm dating myself here, but you would just call these teams and write down a note about what happened. I also had a like eight page word document with every single division one school on it with the name of their SID uh, that I would go through periodically and, and reach out to these people. So, uh, you know, it wasn't the most glamorous way of doing things, but it worked. I had a job right out of college in Montana, Butte, Montana, a great place to uh, visit Montana, not a great place to live, to be honest with you. But, uh, 
Yeah. And Sorry to all Butte natives, <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, Butte is a, a special, special place. They uh, Butte America and proud of it. That's what their uh, their tagline is. But uh, yeah, about a week after I graduated, I went out to Butte and uh, spent a summer there and uh, with the Butte Copper Kings, who were defunct about two years after I left. Our best player was Francisco Rodriguez, who played in the big leagues for almost 20 years. K-Rod, he was on our team. He was, I think, 17 years old at the time. But uh yeah, it's a start of a start of an interesting road. What uh, and this is just because people can't relate to this anymore. I I barely can. Um, what were those conversations like when you would call a team and be like, "Hi, so I I know you probably get a lot of these calls, but do you need a broadcaster? Please don't hang up." Yeah, it, that's that's kind of how a lot of them went. And uh, I actually went to the winter meetings. Uh, they were in Nashville that year, so I drove from Syracuse to Nashville my senior year um, to kind of network. And even though I didn't get a job there. I'll always believe that going there really helped me get a job because a lot of the people that I got further along in the discussions with were people I had met there in person. Uh, kind of embarrassing slash classic story. Uh, the GM from the Jamestown Jammers called me at like noon on, uh, at my apartment or wherever I was living. And honestly, I was still sleeping. And he could tell that I had been sleeping when I woke, when I answered the phone and, and I, it didn't go well. And Did I, I wake you? Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. it, it wasn't good. I was a late sleeper. A lot, a lot of people are. But uh, I ended up having to call him back later that afternoon and sort of apologize for the fact that I was still sleeping. But it probably wasn't the greatest impression. <laughs> so didn't get that job. No. Yeah. Did not get the job. <laughs> not unless the workday started at 1 in Jamestown, which I don't think it did. <laughs> uh, so what did you what'd you like about minor league baseball? What was what was kind of the length of your, your tenure in the minors? And, and what was good? What was bad about it? You know, it was an interesting way to start your career. And I think there's so many jobs that it's, you know, kind of a good way for guys coming out of school to start their career. Um, I worked 93 days in a row my first summer in Butte. I, I did the team's laundry a few times. Uh, it's a grind. I mean, it is a real grind. And if you're in a league with a lot of travel where, you know, every every team is very far apart, um, I've been to places like Medicine Hat, Alberta in that league. We got stuck at the border coming back into the United States at like four in the morning. You know, these are these are things when you're 22, you're like, oh, this is a little annoying, but it's OK. I'm 22. But what got you stuck at the border? Uh, some of our uh, players uh, passports and things like that weren't necessarily. Uh, it was one of those things where you pull up to the border and they're like, nobody say anything. And, uh, you know, hopefully the customs and this is pre 9-11 at the time. So hopefully the, the guy who's checking the bus out is, you know, in a good mood at three in the morning. Um, sometimes they're not. And sometimes you sit there for a long time. So, uh, yeah, you know, that was interesting. I, you know, I enjoyed it. It was just so fresh and new. Um, it's, it's very humbling in a lot of ways. Uh, you don't come out of school, you know, especially at a great school like Syracuse, you think you're going to be, you know, on the fast track and all of a sudden you're doing the team's laundry. You're working 93 days in a row. It's, you know, it's very humbling. And, uh, you know, you're, you're working for $600 a month. It doesn't include housing, you know? So, uh, you know, I, I got a little tired of it pretty quickly. I ended up doing three seasons. Uh, after that, I went back home to Cincinnati. I delivered pizzas for about nine months, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Uh, it's a great job. Uh, and then I went to Indiana to an independent league, uh, the Frontier League. And from there, I moved to Albany, which is where I live now. Um, and I did a summer of uh, Northern League in Albany, the Al Albany Colony Diamond Dogs, uh, who played at a place that used to house the Double A Albany Colony Yankees. Derek Jeter played there. Mariano Rivera, Jorge Posada, they were all Yankees back in the early '90s in Albany. Uh, but you know, not to sound old, but after a few years, I just decided that you know riding the bus at three in the morning wasn't something I wanted to be doing anymore. But then Sienna comes along, Correct. and for more than a decade, you wind up as the voice of a Division One basketball team. So that's actually the reason I moved from Indiana to Albany was for the Sienna women's basketball and football job. Uh, the football team was not very good. Uh, Does it exist anymore? No. About three years after I got there, they mercifully uh, eliminated the program. Robert, thanks for coming. <laughs> but uh, you still have a job. There just are no games. Yeah, it it was those were some long long afternoons um it was non-scholarship so it wasn't uh, a very particularly high level of football uh especially you know from what you're used to uh but also the women's basketball team they were very good we went to the uh, ncaa tournament my first year there which is uh, still the only time sienna's ever made the ncaa tournament on the women's side uh but then after two years there i took over doing the men's games um and uh the rest i guess they kind of say is history this will be this completed my 17th year 
uh, with the men's team and 14 of those on the radio. Uh, and you got into TV eventually. Yes. Uh, w- what was the turn there? What did you, what made you, well, and, and there's probably a more complex question, but what made you say like you know, TV is the avenue I want to go after a, a time of, a, a ton of time doing radio? Yep. So uh, Doug Sherman, who now works for ESPN, had been doing the TV of Siena home games that were on TV, which is Siena's uh, extremely popular in the New York capital region. It's, uh, you know, draw about 6,000 a game. It's the very biggest game in town. Uh, so Doug Sherman had been doing those games. He kind of moved on to work more with the Metro Atlantic Athletic Conference, the MAC package. Um, Andrew Catalan did the game for a couple of years. He's obviously gone on to a lot of uh, bigger and better things. Uh, but I, I didn't completely eliminate the radio. So when uh, around, I'd say, late 2000s, I started doing the TV games when they were on TV uh, and doing the radio for all the other games. So it was kind of a mixed transition. And then uh, roughly three years ago when I started doing more stuff for ESPN, you know, I had kids. Uh, I didn't want to travel anymore. Um, so I stopped doing the radio. But, you know, it's... I, I, I enjoyed doing the radio. There's parts of it I miss, kind of the description and the – there's an art form to it that I don't think is quite there with TV, uh, but I enjoy doing both, no doubt. Um, current party included here. A lot of people, <laughs> um, they get frustrated when everyone – you all think – like, hey, how come, like, I want to get, I want to get to ESPN. I want to get to CBS. I want to get to NBC. I want to, you know, I want to get to Fox. Um, take me on, like, what led you to get to doing games for ESPN and, and after really chipping away at it for, for a long time to finally get that breakthrough? Yeah, I'll hear that question a lot. And it's a great question. Uh, you know, so how'd you end up doing those games? And I never really have a great answer. Um, you know, it's. It's a long road, and, and all of a sudden, you know, one year after five years of emails going unanswered, one year the email got answered, you know, and the person wrote me back. And, you know, uh, and my contact at ESPN had, had never written me back before. Every year I would send them my stuff in the summer. For so, probably, it's a one-sided contact. Yeah, yeah, it really is. It's like, is he even getting my email? You know, I have no idea. Uh, and I did that for probably— He's actually been dead for seven <laughs> <Yeah>. years. <laughs> is this, you know, he might be a ghost. I don't know. But, uh, you know, for three, four, five years I sent— uh, this person, my, my reels and my resume. Uh, and then one year he wrote back and said, do you want to do the Albany at Buffalo football game? And I said, yes, uh, yes, I would love to do that. Okay. Put it on your calendar. Okay. And that, and, and once you get that foot in the door, then all of a sudden, you know, you get a couple more games. He passes your name along to someone else. Uh, was I any better as a broadcaster after I did the Albany Buffalo game than before? No, obviously not. But, uh, it's just a lot of times it's just about being in the right place at the right time. And, you know, there's still room for me to be in the right place at the right time going forward. But, um, you know, there's no sort of epiphany or, you know, this is how I did it. This is the, the, the magic formula to get to that point. Uh, you know, it's just the grace of God, you know, how much did you ever battle the man? Is this going to happen? A lot, a lot. And, uh, you know, uh, when I did finally reach that point, um, you know, I, I credit people like my wife, you know, she believed that it would happen. I don't think I always believed it would happen, you know, to be honest with you. Uh, I was had a lot of doubts and you, you grind away. And I mean, it's roughly 14 years of doing Sienna games before I got that break, I guess you could call it, to start doing games for ESPN. And it's it's still a very much a freelance part time schedule I have. It's it's not like a full time job for me, although, I, you know, hopefully it will be someday. Um, yeah, there, there's a lot of doubts. There's a lot of nights when you're just like is this ever going to happen? And and for me in particular, you know, I've always worked a quote unquote regular job that has nothing to do with broadcasting. So, uh, you, know, you got to pay the bills, you got a family, you know, you, you're slaving away at a job that you may not really like, you, you may actually downright dislike it, you know, to be honest with you. And, uh, I love you're currently Robert's employer. He uh, loves his job. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it actually is terrific. Uh, if they're listening, which I know they're not, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's a grind, you know, and, and there's no, uh, there's no, set path that I could say people should take to, to get to that point. What was that approach of like, I'm going to get a regular job and do games. Um, Cause that's something I'm sure some people try to figure out how to make this all work because it either doesn't pay or doesn't pay very much. And people have needs. Yeah. I mean, I think anyone who's tried to be in this field of play by play or broadcasting knows it's, it's not a way to get rich quick. Um, you know, and since, 
I guess roughly you know 2005, six ish. I've I've always had an, a normal job, and they've always been accommodating. And it's it's kind of part of my ground rules when I get hired that you know I'm going to miss time for these games. I'm going to miss as little time as possible. Um, but there's a lot of days that I leave my regular job at 2:30. I drive three hours to a game. I do the game at seven o'clock. I drive home to one in the morning, and at eight o'clock the next morning I go back to work. You know, and it's that's just normal for me. Uh, it doesn't make me some kind of hero, but you know that job pays most of my bills, you know, is the vast majority of the salary I'm bringing in. It's not from broadcasting. Um, so you just got to do what you got to do. You guys are the heroes because I, I will do like a game and I get home like, you know what? I, I, tomorrow I'll go to the gym. I'll get to work at 1030. It'll be fine. And then I stop and I think I'm like, you know, God, like there are actually people that have to go to a real job the next day. I am completely slacking in this department. Well, see, in the NBA, they call that load management now. So you have a lot of load management days, and, and kudos to you for, for working that in. I'm the LeBron James of <laughs> Mid-American Conference broadcasters, not in terms of play, just in terms of not, not playing. Um, what uh, What's doing a game for ESPN like? Um, what What's different than a Siena game and being... Uh, able to be on a national platform and with a national crew it's really the people you work with and uh you know i've had some great experiences with the crews that i've I've worked with at sienna but it's just uh the whole production you know a, a producer who's done almost as much research as i have and a color person who does this for a living and, and has done as much research as i have and you know building the storylines and you know, just it's a real team effort to make sure that we're putting out the best product possible and it's you know it's exhilarating to be honest with you it's you know wow that was a great show you know it was a great game obviously having a great game helps or you know a team of interest or things like that uh, but you know, you're just you know in commercials what do you want to what do you want to talk about coming out of the timeout you know that's not something that necessarily happens at a smaller level you know a smaller scope broadcast it's like oh well that that's neat you know let's talk about this and then they get the, the that coach on camera and we can run that storyline with some graphics and some pictures and yeah it's really it's really a thrill that i'm you know hasn't worn off on me yet i remember the first time i did a cbs game like our producer was on the call and was like actively acting asking questions I'm like what you know uh -oh, okay this is cool all right great like this is cool yeah i mean I, and and then it helps because they like, they'll pitch you things. Yeah. Like, this is where we want to go, which is always interesting to see how that all tweaks. Yeah, and it's, you know, the amount of preparation that goes into these games from the production side before the game even starts uh, is just awesome. We were talking about this before we sat down to start here, too. Uh, but what's it like doing a Remy where only you and your analyst are at the venue and a couple other people, um, but everything else is happening hundreds, if not thousands of yeah. miles away? Yeah, it's it's a different challenge, and it's much harder for the analysts than it is for me as the play-by-play, -play, uh, because there is a delay. There's you know a two or three second delay uh, in what's showing up on the what we're saying, and then matching up with what's on the monitor. Um, you know, when I start the broadcast from the very top, they'll cue me to start talking, and then for two or three seconds, it's just black on the screen. There's nothing that comes on until the monitor catches up, basically, and. It's a little disconcerting, you know, hey, let's do the Duke, North Carolina read. And so you, you do the read and nothing, the graphic doesn't show up on the screen for two or three seconds. And you've just got to trust your producer that that is what's going to actually come up three seconds from now. And it does every time. And it's great. But uh, it's a different challenge. And from an analyst perspective, it's it's really tough because they can't talk about what's on the screen at that very moment because the timing is just off. So you can't point out something and say, you know, a Dick Vitale freeze it right there because it's just off by three seconds. You can't do that. You no, know? They're just slow at freezing in the truck. That's <laughs> yeah, all. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, it's a different challenge. But, it, you know, I, I understand the reasons why they, they have games like that. And there's more and more of them. But uh, you get used to it. It's just wild because like we were talking too. like I, I watch even though I'm sitting at the game, I will watch the monitor. And then to have the realization that I'm not watching what you're seeing, um, at least by a couple of seconds, is just a wild thing to have to deal with. And I get, do, well, you so you pretty much you watch the game then, I would guess. Yeah, especially for basketball. I would say for football, uh, to me, and you know this, uh, the hardest part of football for me is seeing the players. I mean, these stadiums are so big. I'm not familiar with the teams a lot of times because I've never seen them before, and it's hard. I mean, it's I will watch the monitor a lot in football because I can't see. You know, especially early in the game, I don't know who caught that pass. He's 70 yards away. Uh, my vision is not terrific, to be honest with you, and I don't know who caught that pass. So I've got to go to the monitor and draw it out a little bit. And you know, Joel caught the pass. You know, it's uh, and I would think that I haven't done any Remy football games, but I would think that would be a real challenge because now you're waiting 
four, five, six seconds to see who actually caught the pass on the monitor. Uh, you know, there's places, and I'm sure you know it well, Akron, Akron's football stadium, you're like in the stratosphere when you're calling the game. It is so high. You have no lack of room, though. No, no. <laughs> plenty of room, which is great, but you're like seven stories up in a 30,000-seat stadium. I mean, I was I have binoculars, and I'm using the binoculars. I still can't see who's got the ball on the other side of the field. You are so high. It's, it's a real challenge. You're just drowned out by the copious amounts of fans. <laughs> yes, the... yes. Thanks, Ted, for coming. Uh, <laughs> we appreciate it. Um, how do you prep for a game? Um, what is your absolute necessity you have to know going into something? I think every broadcaster's got their their way of doing something, and I actually really enjoy the prep. Uh, I'm very meticulous. Everybody's got their their you know. If I looked at your chart and you looked at my chart, it probably wouldn't make any sense. No one could read my writing, first of all. But uh, I love that aspect of it. I love. I can't go into a game not being prepared. It's just it's just not in my DNA. I know I won't use 70% of what I have written down. I actually try to I have a tendency to overstat, you know, use too many stats and it's actually a challenge for me to to dial back, use less numbers. Don't talk about so many numbers because I've got them all in front of me, you know, and and you your natural urge is to oh, well this this plays to that stat that I have. Sometimes it's just a little much, and that's an urge I have to fight uh, and, and work more storylines in and things like that. But uh, I love the prep, and it's, uh, you know, football especially is a lot. It's, you know, especially for me, I, I, I've got young kids. I work a full-time job. I mean, on Tuesdays and Wednesdays, I'm up till midnight or 1 in the morning because I'm I'm not starting my prep till 8 or 9 o'clock at night uh, after the kids go to bed. and. You know, it's a grind, you know, going through 50 roster bios or, you know, the, the unbelievable amount of stats there are, notes and things like that. Basketball doesn't take quite as long. Obviously, there's not that many players, so that's a much shorter time. But, uh, yeah, I really enjoy that aspect of it. I know you're a, you're a big conference call guy, too, and picking coaches' <laughs> brains. Um, what, what do you need to know? Like, what, what are questions that you find that are most helpful? Is, I want something that's not coach speak. And I'll say this, I do conference calls a lot because I can't go to the game early because I'm at a regular job. That's why I do conference calls, because I actually <laughs> can't go to shoot around or show up at the site, you know, show up for a football game on Friday morning. I can't do that because I have to work until Friday afternoon and then take the last flight out on Friday yeah. to get to this game. And hopefully it makes it. Um, so to your point, that's why I do conference calls. But just give me something out of the ordinary. Football coaches in particular are just so... You can tell early on if this guy's going to give you something or if he's not. You know, he's just—he's a grinder. Uh, he's—he's yeah, he's so hardworking. I mean, there's just the football coach answer. And when you get a guy or a coordinator who you can tell might actually give you something usable or off the beaten path a little, then you really try to hit that guy hard and, and get some good stuff out of him. You know, the good coaches know, uh, and good coaches in terms of media know. You know, you're not trying to grill them. You're just trying to make their program look good, make them look good by by association. And the way to do that is by giving me something interesting that I can talk about the great things that are going on with your program and with you and where it's going. Uh, you know, that's what I'm looking for when I'm talking to these guys. What do you do to get on the same page with your analyst, too? Because uh, oftentimes you're not coming in with a lot of time, um, like dinner beforehand probably out of yeah. the question. So it's one of those sit down, talk about it, go. Um, how do you coordinate so that you, you are best prepared to uh, interact with them? Yeah, one of the things, uh, Wikipedia is phenomenal. Uh, a lot of, especially in football, I work with somebody different on, on my ESPN three games. I work with somebody different almost every week. So uh, it's hard to build a rapport. I like to get to know something about their, usually their former players or coaches. So I, I get some information about their playing careers, uh, know what position they played, what some of their career highlights were. Uh, and, but it's, you know, in FCS playoffs this year, I worked with the same person three weeks in a row. And, and I can't tell you how much better our working together was by the second and the third week rather than the first week because you know we just i just know what he's a better idea of what he's going to do uh you know he knows what i'm going to do we're not stepping on each other as much i know how to set him up a little better but that's a challenge you know i i envy the people who can work with the same person every week you know or twice a week it's it's just a lot easier to work with somebody that you have that experience with good uh i was gonna say good football but it could be basketball too uh good broadcast to you on television beyond time and score all that stuff uh, encompasses what like what separates like this is fine to like this guy's good i think the game helps uh you know i always 
I know that's something that the, the broadcaster can't control. A good game and a good atmosphere always makes us sound better. Um, you know, a lot of times, you know, going in, this is going to be a real live environment or it's going to be a not live environment. And, you know, people like, oh, you know, what are you looking for? I don't care who wins. You know, I just want a good game that's close, that's exciting. That's all we're asking for. As far as uh, what I look for uh, from a play-by-play -play guy or a broadcast team, um, factually correct is a big thing to me. Um, I'm a guy who notices when things aren't right because I know I, I, I flog myself when I get a fact wrong, and I, I pride myself on doing that as infrequently as possible. But just bring an excitement level. You know, I want to be excited. I don't want you to yell the whole time, but I want you to be excited and not be like, this is the fourth game I've done this week. I, you know, I'm just, you know, I, I'm in wherever tomorrow. You know, it's just the next game I'm doing. Well, I'm tuning in right now. I want to be excited about the game. Give me a reason why I should care, uh, especially if the game's not a very good one. You know, I'm going to change the channel, you know. So, uh, you know, and that's kind of the main things I look for. There's different analysts I like, guys I don't like, um, you know, and it's just it's – it's just the working together. And, you know, when you get like a McDonough and Billis and, and things like that, there's a humor aspect of it that I really enjoy. You know, um, it's not just about the game. You know, if I can tell you guys like each other, that helps a lot, too. How much do you watch things back, particularly considering what we just said about not having time? Almost never. Um, <laughs> to be honest with you, not until I'm putting together my reel at the end of the year. Then I watch over the course of a couple of weeks. I'll watch all the you know tapes that I've gathered. Um, but it's not something I do nearly enough. I, I like you said, I don't have time. Um, even when I'm going back to watch my reels, I'm just looking for a usable five minute stretch and a couple of nice highlights. You know, am I critiquing myself as much as I should? Definitely not. Um, I wish I could do that more often. I wish other people would do that more often. To be honest, do you do you get feedback from producers from higher ups? Not really. Um, the only I've learned pretty quick that if you don't get any feedback, that's good because the only feedback you're going to get is if something got messed up, probably. So, um, you know, at, at my level, which is pretty low on the totem pole, to be honest with you, there's almost no feedback. And and I would like some feedback, to be honest with you. You know, it'd be nice to know. Uh, this is something you could have done better. We really like this. We didn't like that. Uh, this is something you could work on to, to improve. Uh, but that's mostly self done at, at you know from me personally. Got one more thing that's kind of out of left field for you. We were talking about the fact that you have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> yes. um, on said Wikipedia page, it says you are fluent in Mandarin. So that's on my LinkedIn page. Um, I would say they got that off my LinkedIn okay. page, no doubt. Um, I can speak a little. I, I think fluent's probably a little bit of an overstatement. Uh, I can understand pretty well. There's only one person in the world I talk to in Chinese. It's my grandma. She lives in Taiwan, and that's all through FaceTime. Uh, so I use a lot of hand motions. I would not say I'm fluent. I am conversational, but I do understand much better than I speak. I think my biggest problem is I, I don't have a very big vocabulary, um, so I end up using the same words over and over again. Uh, my... It's something I would like my kids to speak, um, but fluent might be a little bit of an overstatement. So that, that precludes my next question of, like, I was going to say, like, did you ever think about, or maybe, like, in your current situation, you ever thought about, like, brushing up on it and pursuing, hey, maybe I'm going to try to do something in Mandarin that and see what happens. That would be a phenomenal idea, Joel, and I have thought about that. Uh, I'm probably too lazy to really put a lot of work <laughs> into that. Hopefully I can just make it in English. But, uh, yeah, it's... I have no doubt there's going to be a lot of opportunities like that. I mean, you see some of these Spanish broadcasts. I mean, if you were into basketball and could speak Spanish, like, really well, like, there's a lot of opportunity for you, you know. Even in baseball, like, I, I yeah. think now, because I took, like, seven years of Spanish, I speak none of it. <laughs> um, and I, I, I saw Mike Cousins once when he was still in the minor leagues, like, doing an interview in Spanish. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself, that would have been very good to know how to do. Oops. Yeah, at baseball especially, because so many of the players, you know, are, are, you know, Spanish speaking and some of them don't speak English. So, you know, if there's five players on a team that don't speak English, that's five guys you can't talk to. So, uh, no, that's, that's a great point. And, and yeah, I couldn't speak two words of Spanish in my life depending on it, but the more Yao Ming's and, you know, Jeremy Lin's there are, maybe that could help me out. You know, Robert, uh, how do people find you? How do they track you down on social media or, uh, or watch you on the television? 
so I have a Twitter feed, uh, Robert Lee PXP, um, and I have a website which is only updated about once a year. It's on WordPress. I believe it's Robert Lee PXP dot WordPress dot com. Uh, it just has my resume and uh, and uh, you know videos. It, it generated a huge spike in traffic about eighteen <laughs> months ago, uh, but it's it's very infrequently visited. You actually crashed WordPress. I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, I, I believe the final number was about fourteen hundred. Unique visitors visited it in one day. I'm not sure what happened, but uh, that was. You're now under government investigation for why people are trying to find this one website when they weren't before. Yeah. Uh, Robert, uh, best of luck tonight. We're sitting here in, uh, in Cleveland, so best of luck on the MAC championship. Uh, good to visit with you the last uh, couple of days here, and um, hopefully we'll run into each other down the road. Joel, very much appreciated, and uh, best of luck to you as well. All right, that is Robert Lee on Play by Playcast. Robert Lee PXP on Twitter at Robert Lee PXP. I. I've always been fascinated. Like the the guy's got a full time job and a family, and like I stay up all night doing prep work for games because I'm weird. Um, like literally, like I I will stay up until two in the morning doing prep because I go down wormholes, or I'm on the road for a game, or I'm traveling for a game, whatever it is. Like, you have the leniency where in the morning I don't have to be at work at 9 a.m. when the horn sounds. Like, I've always been amazed by the people that have to do that, that have full-time jobs. My color analyst, David Eha for men's basketball, like, he drives six hours round trip to do home games, three hours to the game, three hours home, and then still has a job the next day. Now he works from home, but still, like, has to get up and, like, do a job that is not <laughs> working in the athletic department. Um, so like kudos to all of you out there that do that because for some of us, like this is our job. And for me, like the play by play is my job and there's more to it, but it's all within the athletic department. Um, there are a lot of people that balance this as like a second, it's like a side hustle slash want it to be a main hustle. And, uh, they, they find a way to make it work and to balance it and uh, to do both things phenomenally. Um, from a timing perspective and a time management perspective, uh, I've always been uber impressed by that. Um, so postscript on our conversation with, uh, with Robert Lee this week, uh, until next week when, uh, I will come to you from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, we're out of time. So this is PXP cast. My name is Joel Gadette. Enjoy the rest of the first weekend of the NCAA tournament, everybody. And we'll see you back here next week. Same bad time, same bad channel. Well. That will do it from St. Louis, where the score is inconclusive.